you brought your Bibles this morning, be finding Luke chapter 2, if you would please, thank you all for having me back, or you could say like a bad penny, I just keep showing up, you can't get rid of me. Luke chapter 2 this morning, and want to begin looking at about verse 41, and as y'all are finding that, I hope everyone had a wonderful celebration of the birth of the Lord and had a good time with family and friends. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 41. The Bible says this, His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days as they returned, The boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and saw him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Do you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them, but his mother kept all these things in her heart. Father, we just thank you for your word. We ask you, you open our minds and our hearts to the Holy Spirit this morning as you speak to us, because Father, you promise us in your word that we're two or more together, you're there with us. And the Holy Spirit is here as our guide, and we pray that we would be tentative to his voice this morning we would heed what you would have us to know and father we thank you for your word and thank you for that guidance for it shows us your love and your watch care for us and father now we just give you the praise and glory for what you're about to do and we praise you all these things and give you all this in the name above all names the name that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess the name of the lord jesus we thank you in jesus name we pray Now, Passover, those of you probably know, is an eight-day holiday celebration that the Jewish community holds once a year. It commemorates God's freeing the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. Now, as holiday celebrations go, it's probably the most important Jewish holiday of the year. It's kind of similar to Christmas for us a Christmas celebration. For example, like Christmas, Passover is a time of family get-togethers, gift giving, feasting, traveling, socialization, and it's all about Jesus. Whether they want to admit it or not, it's all about Jesus, okay? Now, during this time of religious festivities and holiday celebrations, something interesting happens. When Mary and Joseph finished the days, as it says there in verse 41, which means that the holidays were over, they were packing up and headed home, okay? Time to go, got to catch the flight, got to get the next camel out of, out of here and, and head back home, okay? They traveled one whole day before they dawned on them, say, hey, where's Jesus? Now, you're probably thinking, well, how could that happen? What kind of parents lose their child? Well, understand that back in those days, when people traveled, especially for Thanksgiving, they traveled to feast and celebration, they did it in caravans. It was for protection and all of that stuff. Relatives, in fact, whole villages got together and traveled as a group with the women and children leading the way because they set the pace. They were a little slower than the others. And, and the men folk bringing up the rear and, and, and watching and guarding the sides. So in all fairness, Jesus could have easily gone from one group to another and not been missed. Joseph would think that 
Jesus is with Mary and the other children. Mary could think that Jesus is with Joseph and the men or, or, or the other relatives. And we say, okay, you know, that's understandable, but what's this got to do with us today? Well, quite a bit, actually, because today, it seems, in a very real sense, that after the holiday celebrations are over, okay, many people, just like Mary and Joseph, lose Jesus. Because they're all, you know, holidays are over. Folks are headed home. Thoughts now turn to redeeming them gift cards we got. Returning those unwanted gifts, that flashy tie, them kids got us, got to go back, okay? Getting back to work, paying the bills, and Jesus gets lost. And having said that, I want to ask and answer several questions, five questions really, from these nine verses of scriptures that I hope will help impact our hearts and as we head into this new year, help give us a focus on not what's going to come, but who's already been here. Question number one, can we really lose Jesus? Well, the answer to that question is both yes and no. No, you cannot lose Jesus in the sense of relationship. You see, even though Mary and Joseph lost Jesus, their relationship did not, to him did not change. They were still his mother and, and earthly father. Why? Because they lost Jesus, but Jesus never lost them. You see, if you're truly saved, you can never lose your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can strain it, you can stain it, you can damage it, but you can never lose it. How do we know? Jesus says so in John chapter 10, verse 27. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. Jesus clearly tells us that you don't get eternal life when you die, you get it when you believe, and therefore it stands to reason that if you have eternal life, it can never end, because if it does, it wasn't eternal in the first place. Jesus said, I give them eternal life. They never perish. Then he backs it up by saying, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. So that tells us that nothing can sever your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. No event. No circumstance, no sin, no attitude, not even the devil himself. And you know how I know that? Because listen, if the devil could take those of us who are truly saved out of God's hand, why hasn't he done it? I mean, do you really think he's sitting back and, 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 and we're going to heaven because he decides he's kind enough to want us to go to heaven and spend eternity with the Lord I don't think so. The only reason he hasn't is he can't. And I challenge you to name one, just one thing powerful enough to open the hand of Almighty God the Father and take one of his own out. I remind you that Psalms 37, 23, and 24 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Did you catch that? The reason we can't lose our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is because we're not holding on to him. He's holding on to us. You see, even though Mary and Joseph lost Jesus, their relationship didn't change. They were still his parents. You say, well, okay, then, then in what sense can we lose Jesus? It's in the sense of fellowship. The sense of fellowship, okay? Notice what Mary and Joseph said. Your father and I have sought you anxiously. Now that word anxiously means full of distress or nervousness, uneasiness of mind or a brooding fear. Their hearts were distressed. They were uneasy and they were fearful. You know why? Because 
they're out of fellowship. And if you're out of fellowship with Jesus, folks, listen, you have no joy. Oh, don't get me wrong. You might have happiness and fun, but you don't have any joy in your heart or life no matter what time of year it is. You see, I believe with all of my heart and all of my mind and all everything that I am that the most miserable person on the face of the earth isn't a lost person but a born-again believer out of fellowship with Jesus. You want to know whether or not you've lost fellowship with Jesus? Just take the joy test. Is there joy unspeakable and full of glory in your heart right now, no matter what's happening in your life? Well, now, David, wait a minute. Nobody's supposed to be joyful all the time. Really? It's not what God says. God says in Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. There's that word always in there. The only way you can rejoice always is to rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because unlike circumstances, Jesus never changes. His love never changes. His grace to you never changes. We know this because Hebrews 13.8 says very clearly, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So how can you lose the Lord Jesus Christ? We can lose him in fellowship. In other words, you can put it, there's a term we use as Baptists, it's called backsliding. God keeps moving, but we don't. Okay? Or God is there and we get away from him. Jesus was doing right there. He said, I'm about my father's business. He was in his father's house studying his father's word, and guess who was moving? Mary and Joseph were headed. They were getting further and further away. That's the way we can lose Jesus in our fellowship. And especially when it comes up, we got a new year coming up. We don't know what the new year brings. This last year was bad enough. We got elections coming up, and we got politicians going to all this kind of stuff. The world is at war, it seems like. North Korea is rattling sabers. Israel's at war with Hamas. Other people are threatening to jump in. Ukraine's at war with Russia. Everywhere we see hatred is on the rise. Racism is on the rise. We don't know what the new year brings, and we can easily lose Jesus by worrying about what's going on around us. We can lose that fellowship and get caught up in what the world is doing. But folks, don't lose your fellowship, okay? There was no connectivity because Jesus wasn't in their midst. So can you lose Jesus? Yes and no. Second question I have, who can lose Jesus? Well, look at verse 23. When they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother didn't know it. Joseph and Mary lost Jesus. You say, well, what's the point? Simply this. If his father and mother could lose him, anybody can. And guys, listen, it's it, many, many times it's the ones we least expect. Could be your husband, could be a wife, friend, child, deacon, staff member, Sunday school teacher, the one behind the pulpit. Every one of us are in danger of losing Jesus. In fact, if you read the Bible, you'll find out that many times it was the best of the saints who got out of fellowship with God from time to time. Noah, Moses, Samson, David, Peter. We can go on and on. Just read about it. They got out of fellowship with God time and time again. That's why Bible, that, that's why God warns us in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No one is above losing fellowship with Jesus. Folks, <laughs> You can lose fellowship with Jesus with a Bible under both arms sitting right here in these pretty blue pews on Sunday morning. Oswald Chambers said this, quote, an unguarded strength is a double weakness. If you think that you're beyond getting away from God, you're wrong. 
And if I think that, I'm wrong. Folks, listen, I'm no better than any, anybody else in the Bible. I'm no better than Moses or Noah, and I'm no better than Peter or any of those. If it happens to them, do it. In fact, the devil sought Peter, as God said, to shift him like wheat. And folks, I tell you what this, many times the devil aims his biggest guns at God's most faithful saints. If you think you're beyond it, forget it. Anybody can lose Jesus. It doesn't matter who or what you are. You'll never come to a place this side of heaven where you're not in danger of slipping away from the Lord. So who can lose Jesus? Any one of us. Any one of us. The third question I've got, well, where do we lose Jesus? Yes, we can lose Jesus. Anybody can do it, but where? Well, look at verse 41. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. Now, Mary and Joseph didn't lose Jesus in a nightclub, didn't lose him at a bar, didn't lose him at a concert, didn't lose him at a party, okay? They didn't lose him in any of that places. They lost him after Passover, a celebration that was supposedly all about Jesus. Now listen, could it be that instead of getting closer to Jesus during our holiday celebration come the new year, we have to repent and go back to the Lord because we've gotten away from him? Don't fool yourself, folks. Because any one of us in here again can lose fellowship with Jesus and backslide with the Bible under both arms. In fact, you know what? It happened to an entire church. A church in Laodicea. And Jesus tells them in Revelation 3, 17, Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, I have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched, Miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And then three verses later, he says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Now, many times we use those verses as an evangelistic text, and that's fine. But there's something else there. Because think about it. Where is Jesus knocking? At the door of the church. We're very fond of quoting Matthew 18, 20, which says, where two or three or more are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. But many times we've so forgotten him that instead of being on the inside with us, he's on the outside knocking to come in. The Passover celebration separated Mary and Joseph from Jesus. And what a lesson and warning that ought to be to us. They lost him in the midst of a religious celebration guys in the highest holy holiday of the jewish culture passover they lost him we just went through christmas and i can tell you it's easy to lose jesus during that celebration the wrapping paper's flying and the kids are screaming the pots are boiling on the stove you're sweating over the stove everybody's in the kitchen doing this doing that we're running around okay we're running around getting everything ready and everything prepared and we forget the fact that christmas is all about death jesus came for one reason and one reason only to die for you and for me guys that's why he come god the great god of the universe restricted himself to the womb of a young teenage girl. <laughs> Man, just think. God became an embryo that divided into a couple of cells. His heart split and began to beat. His little fist began to grow. All inside the womb for one reason. His one purpose was Calvary. Not so that we could open gifts and decorate a tree and all that good stuff. That's fine and wonderful. But it was one reason, Calvary. 
Calvary. And in the midst of that celebration, a religious celebration all about it, they lost him. It, it, it's like the story of the, the old story of the fabulously wealthy prince who fell in love with, oh, a beautiful princess. I mean, his love for her knew no bounds. A short time after they were married, the princess suddenly died. And the prince, he was just heartbroken. He vowed that he would build the most glorious tomb that had ever been built. So he gathered the best architects in all the kingdom. They drew up plans for a beautiful shrine that would make the Taj Mahal look like an outhouse. They started building, and every day he would go out and watch the progress. The spires went up. The marble gleamed. The gold overlay flashed in the sun. He demanded that everything be done in perfection because his love for her would settle for no less. One day, as the shrine was nearing completion, the prince went up to one of the spires and looked down, thinking, oh, how beautiful and perfect it is. And suddenly he noticed something that seemed out of place, something that just didn't seem to, to, to fit. So he called his head workman up to the tower, and he pointed down there and said, hey, hey, you see that? You see that? It doesn't fit. Remove it, and the shrine will be perfect. So the worker went down and gathered his fellow workers, and they removed the coffin of the princess. Now, when I think about that story, I can't think, or I can't help think about how we have a wonderful, elaborate, joyous, celebrations for Christmas every year, supposedly all about Jesus, and yet more and more frequently we act as if he's in the way, cramping our style, that he doesn't fit. What about you this morning? Have you somehow lost Jesus amidst all that's going on? Just take a look at your life. Have you somehow lost Jesus? That leads me to the fourth question. Question number four. How can we lose Jesus? Well, look at verse 44. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. How did Mary and Joseph lose Jesus? Well, it wasn't by being drunk. It wasn't by getting high. It wasn't by opposing him and even denying him. There's a word there if you have a New King James Version. It's called supposing. You can underline that word, supposing. They lost him by presumption. They just assumed that Jesus was with them and they didn't check. You know, many times we get the same way. We just assume because we show up on Sunday, because we give our tithe, because we do the things we do, Jesus is always with us. That's an assumption that's very dangerous. Mary and Joseph went day by day, step by step, one step at a time, and with every step they got further and further away from Jesus, assuming the whole time he was with them. Is that true of you this morning? Are you sitting here this morning assuming you're right with God? Are you just assuming that Jesus is a reality in your life? Listen, it's easy to do. Samson was a good example. Remember him? The Bible tells us in Judges chapter 16, verse 20, that the Spirit of the Lord departed him, and he didn't even know it. He never knew it. You can witness, you can sing, you can serve, you can come to church every time the doors open. You can teach a class and go from day to day thinking, I'm fine. It is well with my soul. But are you really? Or are you just assuming? Mary and Joseph went a day's journey assuming that Jesus was with them. 
Folks, you see, neglect is the cause of backsliding. And backsliding takes us away from Jesus, and it all has its roots in assumption. Remember that church I mentioned in Laodicea? The church said to itself, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. You realize the danger we're facing this morning? True believers, I'm talking to you. You realize the danger we face? You could be hearing this message assuming that Jesus is real in your heart. I could be preaching this message supposing Jesus is real in my heart. But is he? Is the presence of Jesus in your life, in my life, right now, a reality or a supposition? Are you willing this morning to look into your own heart and see? Matthew 6, tells us the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will full of light. What does he mean, therefore, if your eye is good? It means that if you have your sights firmly on Jesus Christ, no side issue, nothing you've withheld, there's no unconfessed, unrepented of sin, there's no love greater than your love for the Lord Jesus in your heart, then you have a singleness of eye. And folks, that's not an easy place to come to. You know why? Because it requires us to get alone with God and let him peel us like an onion one layer at a time. Are you willing to do that? Are you determined to do business with God until your eye is good and your whole body is full of light? Until you know that you know that you know there's absolutely nothing between your soul and your Savior? Until you do, until you know that you know that it's not supposition, that Jesus Christ is real to me? I want to suggest that we all do that from time to time. That we take a spiritual inventory so that we don't lose Jesus by supposing he's with us because it's an easy thing to do. I mean, how many times have we heard of great men or women of God who've fallen? And we're like, wow, how could that happen? Maybe there was some presumption there. Well, you know what? Because I'm a preacher, I've got it. Baby, you've got it. I'm a preacher all as well. I mean, God, God may be a preacher, man. I can do, uh-uh. No, 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 no. I can do it just as easy as anybody else. There's no one above. We can suppose all day long, but is the reality there? And question number five. How can we find Jesus again? What if we say, yeah, you know what? I have gotten away from you. I, I've kind of lost Jesus. Man, the holiday was so hectic for me. All the kids were in. The grandkids were screaming. The dogs were barking. There's 12 people in my house. I had people laying on both couches, air mattresses on the floor. We couldn't move to get to the bathroom. Thought I wasn't going to make it. The place is a wreck. And they're gone. And you realize, you know what? I did lose Jesus. Maybe there was an opportunity. I don't know whatever it is. But if you just do that, you get with Jesus, you do an inventory, and you find out maybe you have gone a day's journey. How do we find him again? Well, look at verse 45 and 46. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. Now, how did Mary and Joseph find Jesus again? by going back to where they first lost him. They went back to the temple where they first lost. If Jesus Christ isn't real to you right now, if you don't have that conscious awareness of his presence, go back to where you first lost him. You say, but wait a minute, I don't know where that was. I believe if you open your heart to the Lord, he'll show you where it was. Maybe we ought to try praying the prayer We've been given in Psalms 139, 23, which says, Search me, O God, 
and know my heart. Try me and know my anxiety and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Folks, we really know where we've gotten away from the Lord. You know it. Maybe you've just been neglecting your quiet time. Maybe you've loved watching TV more than you love reading the Bible. Maybe you've stopped praying or attending worship like you used to. Maybe you've got some bitterness or, or, or grudge in your heart. Maybe it's just carelessness going on day after day without tuning your heart to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Regardless of where or how you lost Jesus, you'll always find him again right where you left him because you're the one that's moved, not him. Wherever it was, go back to that spot. Go back to that spot and deal with whatever it was. And again, you can ask God to show you it. Because listen, until you do, you can't have that fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Where did we get out of fellowship? Where did this problem come from? You can't have that fellowship, folks, with Jesus Christ until you go back and rediscover him. They looked all over Jerusalem, and it says they finally went where? To the temple, to the Father's house. And where was Jesus, right? What did he say? I'm doing my Father's business. What do you mean you didn't know where I was? Folks, I know where Jesus is. I know what he's doing. But do you know where you lost him? Folks, listen. I, I, I'm finished, but I want to leave you with this point. How tragic it would be if you were I, a godly man or a godly woman, enter the new year without Jesus. Enter the new year out of fellowship with the Lord. Would you be willing to say, in the words of that old hymn, I've wandered far away from God, but now I'm coming home? Would you be willing to take an inventory of your heart? Let me ask you a pointed question. Do you, right now at this point, love Jesus more than you've ever loved him before? And if you can't answer yes, then there's an issue. If Jesus does not mean more to you now than he did before, it's time we take an inventory. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Will you take an inventory of your heart this morning? Is Jesus Christ real to you? I'm not asking, listen, I'm not asking you about your salvation. That's relationship. I'll ask those of you that never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, you don't have a relationship. We'll get to that in a minute. But I'm not asking you folks to save about your salvation. I'm asking you about your fellowship. Are you just assuming and presuming that all is well with your soul? Was there ever a time when you loved Jesus better than you do right now? If so, I'm just going to be pointed and straight, then maybe you're backslidden. When we cease to be better, we cease to be good. And let's spend a few moments in prayer. I'm going to ask one of our musicians just to play softly for just a moment. And I want you to do a little inventory of your heart this morning. And let's just see if perhaps in some way, somehow, that we might be supposing Jesus to be in the midst when in reality, we've been walking in supposition farther away from him. Will you do that? Take a moment. We're just going to play quietly for just a moment. It's all. I'm not going to pray yet. I want you to spend a moment seeking God. Search me, O oh God. Is there anything in me? Have you lost Jesus this morning? It's so important that we have him.
this next year may be the year that he comes back. Is Jesus lost to you? Father, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And Father, my prayer is that every one of our hearts, mine included, Father, are opened up to you. Lord, the Holy Spirit is here and we know it. Would you search our hearts this morning? And Father, if there's something there in my heart, our heart, Father, will you show us? Father, we want the strongest fellowship with you we can have, especially in the uncertain days ahead. And if there's some one of us, Father, in here this morning out of fellowship with you, would you now speak to their hearts, give them the courage to come, either, either where they are or come to the altar and get with you. And Father, help us correct that. And Father, while the saved and those that are your children in here are praying with inventory, I ask you for anyone in here who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior this morning. I pray that the Holy Spirit would so touch their heart that they would realize that they can't lose Jesus because they never had him in the first place. And Father, that can be corrected as well. Because the Bible says, whoever confesses me with their mouth, you'll confess before us in heaven. We believe, Father, in the heart, confess with the mouth. Would you help them believe this morning that you died for them, that you love them, and they can be saved? And Father, now we turn this invitation over to you. I don't know what, what's going on in people's hearts. All I know is that I tried the best I could, Lord, to communicate what you asked me to communicate. And Father, now we ask you, that if there's someone need to be saved, save them, Father. May today be the day of their salvation. And for those of us that are saved, Father, help us lift the burdens. Father, show us clearly and concisely. Take the scales of spiritual blindness from us and show us this morning where we've gotten away from you, that we might return to that place and set things right. And Father, we thank you for your love and your grace and your word. Thank you for second chances. And thank you for all you've done this past year and for what's ahead in the year to come. And Father, now we ask you to rule and reign during this invitation. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. If you need to come, you come. If you just need to come to the altar and pray, pray. If you don't want to do that, right where you are, you can do it. If you want to join this church, come on down. We'll show you how to do it. If you've never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, you come. I'll be glad to show you how to do it. It's a very simple thing. If you've asked God for the inventory, get with God and be willing to do business with Him because He loves you and He wants to do business with you. As we sing, if you need to come, you come. You come.